Today, Pastor Hagee and I are going to be talking about what God can do when you're willing to put your faith to work and see His hand move in your life. I know you're going to be encouraged as you continue to hear His testimony of God's faithfulness in 65 years of ministry. Welcome to The Difference. Today, I get to continue listening to more of God's faithfulness upon the life and ministry of my father, Pastor John Hagee. 65 years is a long time, and there are many details to cover, but some of them you may not have ever heard before. For example, what was it like the night that gunshots rang out in church, and how do you grow a church when there's just no room to grow? Dad, you took us from your childhood to your conversion, the beginning of ministry in 66. Your here in San Antonio to begin what might be a church. It's not a church. Yeah, At this church. point, it's just a gathering. Yes, exactly and so right. you started meeting where? We had our first meeting at home about a mile from here. We had um, eight adults and about 10 children. So you were a young church? We were a young <laughs> church. We were a broke church. <laughs> Not broken, but broke <laughs> financially. You were a church in name and more like a Bible study. I will guarantee you that. That's exactly true. And, lots of visions. And then um, I said, we need to get a facility that's more centric to the city so that we can have a broader base of a Because at this point in time, a mile from this location would have been out of town. Mm -hmm. Yes. San Antonio, you were you were meeting outside of the city of San Antonio. San Antonio mm -hmm. was 10 miles the other direction. That's exactly true. So we met two weeks there, and then I found a uh, shopping center that had a storefront, and I rented that for six months. We lost our lease, but there we grew to attendance of over 100. And uh, when we lost our lease, I went to the president of Trinity University and told him I was starting a church. He knew me because he you was the president there. and mm -hmm. he was a football player from there. He obviously thought I was a Presbyterian because we were calling the church Trinity Church. <laughs> and they let us use the beautiful Margaret Parker Chapel, Chapel mm -hmm. at Trinity. It is beautiful to this day and uh, free. God bless the Presbyterians. And while this was going on, we were building this church. Uh, we couldn't get a loan from a bank because banks want to know how long have you been doing this? How long has your pastor been a pastor? What's your financial statements for the last three years? So what we would do was take up the tithe and the offering to pay for the light bill and so forth. And then we'd take up an offering called the building fund. And we would go on Monday morning down to the lumber company and buy all the lumber that money would make and bring it back. And myself and five or six other men for a period of one year built that church. And when we got done with it, it was, it was beautiful. But brother, it was one uphill struggle. Uh, we got the church built and dedicated it. It was full. Not that I was there in that building. I didn't show up until 78. But you have never looked at full as the finished work. Anytime from my life with you that something was full, we needed to expand because there was always more to be reached. Yeah. And, and so I assume when you saw that full building, there was some gratification, but there was also a, a yearning desire to see what else you could do. Yes, we, we, it was a maturation process. It was here that uh, I had a collision theologically uh, because I was taught in Bible school that demons didn't function in America. You had to go to a country where there was ignorance and superstition. And, well, God uh, knows there's no ignorant, superstitious people in this country. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> One Wednesday night, Wednesday night, December, in December of 71, uh, I was teaching and um, a man walked in the door with a loaded gun. And I saw him while I was preaching and I uh, was mentally distracted. And as he walked down the aisle, he roared like a lion. 
I mean, just and people thought I was giving an illustrated mm -hmm. sermon. And uh, at that point in time, that man used uh, some curse words. They knew it wasn't a Bible study. It wasn't <laughs> they knew a Bible he was study. an outsider. <laughs> yeah. And he walked up to the front of the church with a gun. He was about as far as I am from you right now, about eight to 10 feet away. He said, I have come to kill you to prove that Satan has more power than Jesus Christ. And I held my Bible up and I said, no weapon formed against me shall prosper. And he said, I'm going to, I'm going to kid you on a count of three. He started counting. He lied. He started shooting on the count of two. That particular Wednesday night, one of the members of your congregation was making recordings for her own study. Right. And she happened to capture the audio of that moment. We actually have that audio. Take a listen at this as evidence of God's faithfulness to protect the righteous. When he said no weapon formed against you would prosper, he means it. But we have there in, in that audio clip is the event that you just described where this man walks into the church and he had been sent by a warlock to kill you. Yes. He emptied that six shooter, is a 38 pistol, from a distance of 10 feet and never touched me. It was a miracle of God that he, mm -hmm. uh, that those bullets didn't go right straight through my body. Now, eight feet is just a little longer than this table. Yeah, the police came the next day and put up a two before and traced where the bullets went into the wall. And it, they went just in a perfect V and where my body would be standing, which meant the angel of God was there mm -hmm. just deflecting those bullets mm -hmm. because there was just no way he could miss me. Uh, the, this man was running out of the church. The church men of the church stopped him and the, he was arrested, taken downtown, booked, uh, sent to an asylum for the criminally insane, was there for 90 days and three psychiatrists uh, deemed him fit to take his place in society. And he went home and climbed a tree and hung himself. What did the church do? Because you know, I would imagine there was probably a, a little bit of, of concern about the safety of our, of our future here. What, yeah. what was the response? The, the response of the congregation was that I immediately started to do biblical research. I found Derek Prince and with his guidance, I began to teach the principles of demonology to a church that had never heard it from a pastor who had never experienced it. Uh, and from that, the church had a growth spurt. Uh, people recognized that we are in a spiritual warfare against a very real devil mm -hmm. and that our objective is to win the loss to Christ and be the light, salt and light of the earth. Uh, our church was full. I, I should have gone to two services, but I'd never been around anyone who ever did. So I said, we're going to build a larger church. So we built the second church that hold 750 people. Uh, and it was a huge leap of faith because one of my deacons went over and talked to a Baptist pastor in that neighborhood, and he said, and I moved my congregation out here and lost half my congregation. Uh, I said, don't look at the failures of other people to judge our potential. We are going to fill that church. And within two months, that church was full, 750 people. And it continued to grow, so we went into two services. And within 12 to 14 months, we were running 
1,400 people, 1,500 people. I was, Which was the biggest church you'd ever seen. At, the biggest church I'd ever preached in was this one. <laughs> and the, the people were coming so quickly, being saved in such numbers, that um, I felt like a guest speaker. I, I could only <laughs> find recognize. people here, there, and yonder that I knew. And so what I did was to take one of the principles that Moses used with the children of Israel, and I took men in my church who I knew had leadership ability. Most of them were military people. And I taught them the principles of leadership. And I gave each one of them 12 families to take care of. And uh, it worked like a charm. My father said, you are destroying your church. I said, no, I'm not destroying my church. I said, every sheep needs someone they can go to that can help them if they go to the hospital. They need someone they can call immediately. And I said, now they have someone. I said, I am doing all I can do to preach now two services. Mm -hmm. And our two services were full. That's when we had Derek Prince come. And he gave a wonderful teaching. One night, the night that he had the deliverance service, uh, in one particular moment, he got up and he started praying for the manifestation of the Holy Spirit to drive out demon spirits. And he uh, started praying uh, and about 12, uh, against the spirit of witchcraft, about 12 women jumped to their feet and started screaming like a fire truck. I mean, it was electrifying. At that exact time, about a 24 year old man came running down the aisle and went over to the communion set and knocked it off, came up on the platform. He was coming after Derek and three of the biggest ushers we have knocked him on the, on the floor of the platform and they are having a wrestling match that looks like the wide world of wrestling. At that point in time, about a dozen of a Pentecostal friends started running out the back door it had because enough. they were terrified. That was all. <laughs> I'm, I'm on the platform laughing until I'm crying. I said, I've, I've got a wrestling match going here. I said, I've got this screaming feature over here and I've got people running out the back door. And um, Trying to figure out what key the organist is playing in. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so the church uh, grew it and multiplied. I said, we, we need to build a larger church. So we built the third church, uh, Castle Hills Church on Loop 410. Uh, Castle Hills Church would hold 1,800 people. And it filled, it filled up with the people who were coming already. So we went to a second church, a second service. service. Second service. Mm -hmm. And then we started having services on Saturday night. Mm -hmm. And I was preaching twice on Sunday morning and Sunday night. And we had a midweek service. I should have stopped that one, but that's, a, that's not what I did. So I was preaching one, two, three, four, five times a week. And um, it, was, uh, it was a treadmill. You're but our, a church, lot of hay. <laughs> our church doubled in size and I calibrated how many people were coming. Now, we hadn't been in this church uh, but just a few months and the parking lot was so packed that the chief of police was calling me, telling me I was calling a, causing a traffic jam when my people were getting out on the freeway to go home. If you thought that was amazing, you're not gonna believe what you get to hear next. Sometimes we get so caught up in the busyness of the day to day that we forget to do the simple things in life, such as exchanging a friendly greeting with our neighbors. It is time to be God's love in action, like the Good Samaritan. We are called to love our neighbors as ourselves. Does your life reflect His truth? We are called to be salt and light. Our actions and lifestyles need to reflect the light of Jesus to those around us. We are a living testimony of God's goodness. If we are not shining God's love on those around us, us, then who will they turn to? This month, with a special gift of any amount to the ministry, we'll send you a special Not By Bread Alone salt box. For your generous gift of $250 or more, we'll also send you a signed copy of Diana Hagee's commemorative cookbook, Not By Bread Alone, accompanied by an apron, cookbook stand, dish towel, and salt box. 
This set makes a special gift for a loved one. We are called to love our neighbors as ourselves. Call the number on the screen or go to jhm.org slash bread. I'm so grateful that I chose differently. I'm so happy that I chose you. I get to see you become the person God intended you to be. Thank you, Hagee Ministry Legacy Partners. There has never been a better time to share the love of Christ with a mother and a child than right now. When you partner with Hagee Ministries, your legacy impacts lives and transforms a nation. Call today or go to jhm.org slash partner. I've had the privilege of hearing the story of God's faithfulness in Pastor Hagee's 65 years of full-time ministry. Dad, with God's favor and your faithfulness, you never turned to the right or the left once you felt you had His direction. You were just going to keep going in that straight path and see what happened because if you felt God said it, you believed He was going to do it. Uh, I traced this piece of property for five years. It was sold to people in Chicago. The people in Chicago sold it back to people here. I knew the man who was the leader of the people who were buying it on the third go-round. And I went to him and I called him by name and I said, I want this for church and there is going to be a church here. He laughed and said, there is going to be one of the most beautiful malls in all of San Antonio here. I said, no way. I am going to build a church here. I called him by name and I said, you are going to sell me this property at a price that I like and you're going to be thrilled to sell it. He laughed till he almost cried. Six months later, those five businessmen were in a financial crunch for cash. He came to me and said, how quickly can you act on this property? I said, instantly. I had been saving money on the side and had it in the bank. And he said, okay, I'll sell it to you. I said, I need a contract. He got the contract. My attorney approved with the contract. I wrote him a check. I, had, I, didn't, I hadn't told a soul in the church. I didn't tell any of the board members. He didn't I, tell me. I knew, <laughs> that was about I it. I knew they would just go crazy. And uh, so we owned the property. And that night I had a board meeting with our church members. I said, here's where we are. We are going to build a new church for We're Silver. not here to vote. Something yeah. has been done. <laughs> yeah. I said, we are going to build a fourth church. We're going to call it Cornerstone Church. And we're going to, it's going to seat 5,000 people. You know, if I had cursed, I don't think they would have been any more upset. I won't tell you what they said, but it wasn't pleasant. And I said, this is something we must do. And after about uh, 90 days, a large construction company came to me and said, we would like to buy that property from you. I said, uh, write me a contract for it. And uh, I had no intention of selling. I just want to show my board that contract. They offered me three times what we had paid for this property. And I called a board meeting and I passed that contract out to them. I said, this is what we have been offered for this property. I just want you to know what a good deal that this is. So I went from a donkey to a genius in about <laughs> 30 seconds there. And when we built this church, the newspaper trashed us to one just too high heaven because they said it's, it's the vain imagination mm -hmm. of a man whose vision is beyond the bounds of San Antonio. So there's no, no church in San Antonio of that size and magnitude. But I was just simply taking care of the fruit that God had already sent. And when we had our dedication service, uh, the media was there in force, and the headlines the next day is 6,000 attend the dedication service of Cornerstone Church. It was just God saying, keep on going, keep on going. And the, the church uh, has grown and to uh, right now we have over 22,000 active members. And God has always rewarded Amen. the courage 
to do what other people say you can't possibly do. Almost never did I have anyone to say this next building program is a wonderful thing. They were or all it's a lay down cinch. Every one of them was a stretch. Yeah, every one of them was a stretch, and they they were naysayers until the church filled up, and then wow, wasn't that wonderful? And every time it was, this is where we're going to stay for the rest of our life. I was saying, oh no, it's not. <laughs> Heaven we, is going to be the place where you stay for eternity. Mm-hmm. Down here, you just keep moving. Mm-hmm. And I say this all to the glory of God. Amen. He made a way where there seemed to be no way. Uh, There were people who certifiably thought I had lost my mind. But every venture of faith, God helped us to do what people called impossible. When we come back, we're going to continue to talk about God's faithfulness. But take a look at some of the evidence of God's favor on this congregation. If I'd saved all of the letters that said no one will ever live out there, it would fill a bushel basket. No one will drive that far to go to church. And I told my people, the day will come when you will look north, south, east, and west and see nothing but rooftops. And every day when I drive to work and see those cars bumper to bumper, north, south, east, and west, that has all come to pass. It all came true. It wasn't a spontaneous, you know, why don't we just do this? It It was was It wasn't a a master plan. It was just one piece at a time. It was one piece at a time, and it was fasting, and it was prayer. Uh, He would be in his, you know, prayer time at home for hours. And I'd say, honey, what are you doing? He said, I'm just praying. This is a big step. And I just need to make sure that it's God's will. It wasn't uh, willy nilly. Let's just do this. It was fasting, prayer. Agonizing. That's exactly right. Because he knew as the the shepherd of the sheep, that the direction he was taking them was extremely important, never took it lightly. And so Not only was there planning and research, but lots of fasting and lots of prayer. In 2019, in that fall, we began something we called Vision 2020. And by God's grace, this is what is happening right now on this campus. I want to take a look at this video and then I want to hear what you have to say about what you think the future of this organization holds. Almost 45 years ago, Pastor Hagee began a journey that would transform his church and usher forth a television ministry that would broadcast all the gospel to all the world and to every generation. Television is the tool that makes us successful. Without television, we're just another neighborhood church that wouldn't impact Texas, America, the nations of the world. Today, our Vision 2020 campaign is having the same effect. The sanctuary has undergone an impressive remodel, and soon our campus will become a destination for congregants to visit seven days a week. Just as Pastor Hagee once used television to share the gospel, GEI is leveraging today's technologies to continue to preach the gospel to the world. You know, you have often talk to me about how your mother was forward thinking and visionary when she would take bed sheets and paint murals of prophetic charts so that she could teach the word of God. Mm -hmm. For many years, you utilized the same type of resources in having artists Mm -hmm. do On on canvas what she would do on a bed sheet. Now you walk into our sanctuary and there's technology in that environment that can make Moses and the Red Sea come to life. Oh, to tell you the truth. <laughs> <laughs> Graphics. Where, where are we headed next? You know, the, the Bible is a book of generational succession. God gave to every significant spiritual leader generational succession. Abraham had Isaac. Isaac had Jacob. Jacob produced 12 sons. And the blessing that God gave to his 12 sons determined the destiny of Israel for a thousand years. Jesus Christ was born 
he had 12 disciples. Mm -hmm. Paul had Timothy and Titus. So generational succession is a biblical principle. Uh, the first boatload of Hagees who came <laughs> to America in Pennsylvania in uh, 1743 Moravians. on a ship called Spirit, they were Moravians. Mm -hmm. Moravians were fundamentalist Bible believers. And uh, the first group went to Pennsylvania. The next group went to Salem. And, but they came to, as missionaries to this country. There's always been someone in that family to carry the message to the next family. As far back as I can trace, which is over 150 years, it has always been the second son of the second son who carries the torch. My father is the second son. I am the second son of my family. You are the second son. I, I, I see in this generational succession a blessing that comes ancestrally down from men who have been faithful to preach the Word of God. And time. that anointing is now on you for the torch to be carried to your next generation and to your family will come someone who can preach the gospel of Jesus Christ with the power and anointing of our forefathers. And when we were at the wall for, with our first visit uh, to Israel and, and I was carrying you, and at that time we didn't know if you were a, a girl or a boy because they didn't do sonograms, uh, but pastor laid hands on my belly and, and I on his hands and we prayed a double blessing. We prayed a double blessing. Uh, we didn't know, but it was your life, obviously. And, um, and I believe that that double blessing is on your life without a shadow of a doubt. Does not come without hardships, does not come without opposition, does not come without challenges, all of which we have experienced in our own lives, but because of God's faithfulness, mm. this will keep going. Well, the Bible says that God is faithful from generation to generation. Amen. That's right. And I believe, based on the evidence of your 65 years of ministry, that if we are willing to give Him the opportunity, He will do more than we could ever think imaginable. Amen. Absolutely. Amen. So Absolutely. for your faithfulness and dedication to fulfill the calling in your life, and the consistency and the commitment for which you still continue to put towards that effort. God bless you and thank you. Thank we you, sir. It and thank you. To those of you who are watching, I want you to remember that the God we serve has something for each and every one of us to do. Until you are willing to give Him the opportunity, put faith and work together, mm -hmm. God will show you that He is mighty, He is merciful, and there isn't anything that he cannot accomplish with those who are willing to believe in him. God bless you, and thank you for watching The Difference. <laughs>